This is the 750S from British automaker McLaren. Now this basically takes the 720S, which was a brilliant car, and magnifies it. So the questions are, did they need to do that? And can you tell that they did that? And more importantly, my question is, there's one part about this car that I hope they didn't do anything to. Stick around and find out what that is. The 720S, which was a killer supercar, ended production in 2022. McLaren introduced the wildly aggressive 755 horsepower 765 LT that ratcheted things up even more. So, why the 750S? For me, that answer is simple. The 765 LT is a very aggressive car. Uh, I might even call it brutal in every way from the chassis to the suspension, the handling, every part of it. Um, to me, the beauty of these cars is that you actually have the ability to drive them. So unless you are driving on a track all the time, the 765 LT, this wasn't something that I would probably enjoy driving on the road or would want to spend a tremendous amount of time in. What the 720S did so well was give you so much of that epic performance while still being palatable to drive, even as a daily if you wanted. So where does the 750S land on the spectrum? I am so happy that I get to tell you. Right behind your head is a four liter twin turbo V8 that turns pretty much the most expensive gas that you can buy into a delightful noise. It pushes out 740 horsepower and has an impressive 590 pound-foot of torque that comes in full bore at 5,500 rotations. That's 30 more horsepower and 22 more pound-foot of torque than the 720S featured. Can the average bear feel that increment when you're already talking about monster power numbers? Look, if you're Tom Brady with a football, you could probably tell the difference of the PSI by like a hundredth of a decimal point. Um, I'm not sure that I am that fine-tuned to know the difference between 30 horsepower in a car like this. Listen, I thought the 720S was perfectly well-powered, and I feel exactly the same way about the 750S. This engine pulls, then pulls more, and then pulls even more. I got this thing up to 130 miles an hour and still realized I wasn't close to redline and my foot wasn't on the floor. It wants you to give it the beans, nay, it demands it. And when you do, it explodes. Passing somebody, they won't even have time to blink or know that you're doing it before you are completely around to them. This thing is a complete rocket. I'm not one of those drivers that's super comfortable going too hard on an open road. For those who are, the top speed is 206 miles an hour. But suffice it to say, if you're a track animal and you're looking for something that could light your hair on fire on the regular, this car is more than up for it. When it comes to managing that extra power, McLaren leaned into the 765 LT and pilfered the shorter gearing ratios from its seven speed dual clutch transmission. But that doesn't necessarily translate into quicker zero to 60 times. You're only shaving 0.1 seconds off of that time. So now you're looking at zero to 60 in 2.7 seconds. <laughs> That's still really fast. Where you feel it is in the final drive. Shifts are imperceptibly quick and the engine revs higher, making the car feel just a tad more aggressive. It doesn't help you in the gas mileage department, but I'm guessing you're not looking to buy this for its efficiency. And the noise that comes with those sky-high revs sounds great. The effect of that gearing and the engine noise actually makes the car feel like it's going faster than it is, which is 100% what you want a sports car to feel like. Sometimes if I'm driving a 911 or another sports car, I'm driving a lot faster than it feels like I am driving. And I feel like you can get into a lot of trouble that way. I would much prefer a car that does and behaves the way the 750S does. I'm not driving as fast, but boy, it feels like it. It's awesome. The steering ratios were also snaked off the 765 LT. So, if the 720S felt sluggish or imprecise to you, said no one ever, then it's even quicker now. 
Do I notice anything? Guys, I'd like to think I'm a fairly good driver and a pretty perceptive reviewer, but when you're talking about fine-tuned adjustments to something like steering, which is already so quick that it feels like it might be reading my mind before I want to turn, I'm not sure I'm at that next level. Keeping all of this good stuff glued to the road is the same wing that's on the 765 LT, giving you some really good downforce. There are three different positions on it, regular downforce, DRS, which if you watch F1, you know is a drag reduction feature, and high speed braking, which fully deploys the wing in less than half a second to help you with braking stability. If you've been paying attention, then you're sensing a theme here. There's a lot borrowed from the insane 765 LT. So, does this feel just like it? In a word, no. And this is the area that I was hoping that the 750S wouldn't change all that much, drivability. I've driven the 765 LT, and to be honest, I didn't really enjoy it. Does that mean I'm getting old? Please don't answer that. To me, the car felt brutal, extremely aggressive, great for tracking on smooth roads, but on a normal driving surface, it was quite punishing. The magic under the 750S is a hydraulic adaptive suspension that gets new lightweight springs and bespoke twin valve dampers that give you different modes for different driving scenarios. You get a lot of feedback from them in a great way. The springs are 3% softer up front and 4% firmer in the rear. This creature communicates with you, encouraging you to push it around corners. And with that engine whirring and whizzing right behind you, you feel compelled to comply. That does not mean that this is a sedate wallflower. I was talking to the chief engineer at McLaren and each of the three modes is so different and so set apart so completely that it is the widest breadth between the bottom most comfortable setting and the most aggressive setting that McLaren has ever put into a production car. In comfort, I could drive all day. It's so quiet and composed. I don't feel any bumps or imperfections in the road. Sport definitely livens things up a bit and you start to feel things underneath you a little bit. The dampers firm up and get a little bit more aggressive. In track mode, you can feel everything like you've got a roll of quarters in your back pocket, but it's not uncomfortable or overly harsh. It still feels controlled, but you just feel like you are ready to absolutely rock which honestly is exactly how you want it to be. Just like the 765 LT, only you're in the right place at the right time. Personally, I'm not sure that I've driven a car that has as noticeably distinctive drive modes as the McLaren 750S. Brilliant. If you're planning on spending a ton of time on track, you can option your McLaren with a track brake upgrade that combines ceramic discs and monoblock calipers that are derived from the Senna with a new booster and vacuum pump. Yeah, these are stopping you just fine, people. The 750S's body is comprised of carbon fiber. It comes standard with fixed carbon racing seats, but you can also opt for a comfort carbon seat that I could have spent another two days in. And McLaren's done that magical of magical things and added lightness to this car using lighter wheels, that lighter center exhaust, and lighter pistons. All told, they've pulled 66 pounds out of this car. Add that diet to the boost to the engine and you're making a tidy power to weight ratio for one of the most well-balanced and drivable cars made. The 750S has taken every single good thing from the 720S and the 765 LT and put it into this amazing application that I mean, honestly, to me, I just think it's such a versatile car. It's ab absolutely incredible to drive. However, the physical driving part of it is only part of the story. The other part of the story is one that a driver might not notice right away, but one that over time always makes its presence known. And that part of it is the interior. The 750S gets a lot of upgrades that were first seen on the Elva and the Artura. And those changes make the driving experience a lot better. McLaren still remains one of the only, if not the only car company that doesn't put button one on the steering wheel. A bit of a disconnect for a company in F1, but that's to keep the driver focused on one thing, driving. Instead, there's a shrouded steering column mounted display that moves with the steering wheel when you put it into position. 
This new setup is gonna help drivers see things a lot more clearly, especially for a taller driver. I have a really long body, and for me, it really does help to have all of your gauges kind of front and center. Now, these two controls right here are really nice and handy. This one will control your suspension settings. This one is for powertrain. You also have a button right here to turn off um, stability control, and this is to switch into manual mode. All of these elements, to me, are so much better than having things clustered on the steering wheel. Like in a Mercedes, you have the haptic feedback that if you brush your finger against accidentally, it's gonna change all of your settings. So I really like what McLaren have done here. This really does help you just focus purely on driving. A new button called Speedy Kiwi allows the driver to set up suspension and engine preferences and toggle between two different drive setups. So if you're on a bumpy road and you have it set to Comfort Comfort, then with the touch of a button, switch to Sport Comfort or Sport Sport instantly. And again, the feeling between those modes is so marked. If you're in track mode and you put it into Comfort, it's like the road under you completely disappears. It's absolutely insane. Yes. Sorry, I'm gushing about how this thing rides again, but I don't feel like it can be overstated how incredible it is. Okay, back to the interior. You'll get a new 8-inch touchscreen with much improved graphics that's oriented toward the driver, and you do now have Apple CarPlay connectivity. That is a new feature. Android Auto, unfortunately for those who use it, is not available. There are some additional safety features that you can get on your 750S, including front and rear parking sensors, a 360 degree camera, which is a huge bonus because visibility, while it's not the worst, isn't completely your friend. And this one is important for normal person driving. A front end hydraulic lift system so you're not scraping that new extended front splitter. It lifts in four seconds. That is six seconds faster than it did on the 720. Other than those elements, the exterior really doesn't change all that much. Let's just say that now it's a little bit more refined. Its headlights get narrower, there are revised sill intakes and rear wheel arch vents, but mostly this car will look familiar, and whoa, what a looker. This is my kind of supercar. It's sexy without being overworked. The 750S also comes as a spider with a retractable hardtop if you prefer some open air driving. That top will limit the already limited room when it comes to cargo and adds a little bit over 100 pounds to the total weight of the car. It retracts in 11 seconds at speeds up to 31 miles an hour. So do we even talk about fuel economy and cargo space in this thing? Okay, fine. There you go. Here's a peek at the front trunk while we show you gas mileage numbers. If you're curious how much the 750S costs, well, $331,740 for the coupe and $352,740 for the Spider. Those both include a $5,500 destination charge. What else could you buy if you had that kind of money? A Ferrari 296 GTB, the Maserati MC20, really sick 911 variant, and that Lamborghini Storato looked pretty rad. Or you could buy a used yacht a Cessna 350, those are pretty quick, or you could even snag a house, depending on which city you live in. The 750S comes standard with Pirelli P0s, but you can also get it on Corsas or the extra sticky Trofeos as an option. And let me tell you, if you're spending any time on the track, then pony up for the Trofeos. Like Mother Teresa, those tires make a difference. The engineers at McLaren did exactly what I hoped they would do. They took the 720S and they made it better. They sharpened the driving dynamics, they greatly improved the interior, and they kept it a very drivable car. Look, I'm like most people, I will never be able to afford something like this, but if I was cross shopping, you can bet this one would 100% be on my list.